Let's get down to business. Thanks for coming out tonight. I wrote me a manual, a step by step booklet for you to get. Oh, I make money move. You can't see me. My time is now. What up, what up, what up, guys? Welcome back to the Fitness Times Business Podcast, the show created to provide you with the practical and strategic advice to help you level up in fitness, business, your career, your relationships, and your life. My name is Joseph Medsell. I am your host. We have a very special guest for this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Massive Joe's sponsored athlete, IFBB Wellness Pro, uh, amongst a whole bunch of other things that we're going to get straight into, mm-hmm. Jacinda Sharkey. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> uh, Jacinda, you are, you are uh, quite a special individual um, for, for a number of different reasons. Mm-hmm. I've mentioned that you are an IFBB Wellness Pro. As mm-hmm. a matter of fact, the very first yeah. IFBB Wellness Pro uh, yes, yeah. in Australia, yeah, uh, two times over, mm-hmm. and we'll get into, we'll get <laughs> yeah. into that in this yeah. episode. Um, you also run your own business. Mm-hmm. You're a coach. You're yep. a personal trainer. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, what you've achieved at such a young, how old, how old are you actually? I actually turn um, 25 next week in May. Um, on the fourth. There you go. So you're 24, so, about to turn 25. So what yeah. you've achieved at such a young age is um, absolutely uh, out of this world inspirational. Thank you. And uh, I'm super excited to have you on the podcast because we're going to take a um, we're going to take a deep dive into your story, mm-hmm. how you got to where you are right now, mm-hmm. uh, and then we're going to kind of unpack your story. And uh, those of you listening and and watching this episode, you're in for an absolute treat because Jacinda's story <laughs> is. Uh, is is truly inspirational. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, let's get into it. I'm going to let you, you know, I've, I've kind of introduced you. I've given you the elevator pitch. <laughs> I've kind of, you know, th- given all of your highlights. But yeah. introduce yourself, uh, you know, and then, then let's get stuck into, let's call it your origin story. The origin story of Jacinda Sharkey. Yeah. Um, well, I am, as Joe said, um, turn 25 um, next week. First of a podcast, so my apologies if I do get a bit nervous. Really? So it's the first hour. <laughs> yeah, it's first. We've thrown you straight, so, <laughs> straight into one of the top yeah. fitness podcasts in yes. the country. <laughs> and it's yeah, it's very I'm very excited to be here and um, be a part of it. Um, it's been a long time in the making since like COVID and everything's happened. Yeah. So super excited to be here. Well, it's actually, I, so, I, I um, failed to mention, this is actually your first visit to Adelaide. Yeah. Right. And you've been a sponsored athlete for Massive since Joes and TMJ Apparel for almost o- a year now. Almost a year. Or, or, or it might be just over a year now. Yeah. Round about a year. Yeah. Um, and we had planned to, uh, to, to bring you to Adelaide uh, at the start of 2020 mm. and then COVID happened yeah. and then borders were shut. And then we plan to get you here at the end of 2020 and then borders got shut mm. again. And mm. so it's, yeah, been it's, quite, been it's been quite some time, yeah. but you finally made it. So mm. um, not only is this your your first appearance here in the podcast, but it's your first trip to Adelaide. First trip, yeah. It's your first visit to us here at Massive Joe's in Adelaide. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, it's it's quite a jam-packed couple of days it's for gonna, you. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good to be here and just kind of see what's around and see how you guys run, mm. run everything um and just to see it in person and you know be a part of it all like i've I've been so appreciative since like i first turned into a sponsored athlete like last year and you know just be a part of the team so i'm happy i'm here it's a behind the scenes stuff that not many people get to see (laughs) you're you're experiencing Yeah. yeah so jacinda let's you know let's dive into your origin story where where were you born where did you grow up uh you know where did you start so started, um, I was born in Ipswich, moved over, you know, a few different places over the years and um, then did most of my primary school and a little bit of my high school um, based in Woodford. So it was a really small country town. There was nothing there. And, you know, all, all we did for fun was like go to the skate parks and yeah. things like that. And then I have pretty much moved back to Ipswich when I was in grade 11 and 12 and then finished my high school years in there. Um, I was originally studying to be a beautician at the time um, when I was starting to leave grade from 10 because I was just, you know, I was kind of stuck on what I wanted to do and I was really intrigued on, you know, just, you know, 
the beauty side of things and just wanting to learn a little bit more in that. And, you know, at the time I was like, you know, I want to make this a bit of my, you know, own career and things like that. And then for the last, like, two years of high school, I then then started to get want to get into, you know, f- um, the gym and just train a little bit more and then get into fitness and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I started pretty much in the end of high school um, and then t- it just became a massive obsession then since then. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I've, been, I've pretty much been training consistent for the last, you know, or almost seven to eight years now. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever had much of a break. It's just, it's just been full on since then. I don't think I've ever lost motivation. It's just, it's just been really, really ongoing. But um, in the time, like I just, I fell out of wanting to be a beautician. Like it kind of, I know just the industry and, and the type of people that were in it and the girls that were in it. I just, I just kind of got turned off it. Mm-hmm. And when I was, you know, in grade 10, to about 12, my obsession with gym was just, it kind of just took over my life. And I... Was it it a healthy obsession or an unhealthy obsession? It it was, it it was definitely unhealthy. It was, you know, like looking back at it, like I look at things that I did and I'm just like, I don't even know how, you know, my my mentality has changed so much over the years. But it it was definitely unhealthy. And I think um, I started to between grade 10 to 12, I kind of blocked a lot of my friends out. I was really introverted at the time and it was, it was just my kind of outlet to kind of escape. I was never really a massive um, party person or anything like that. I never went out drinking, probably ever went to like two high school parties mm-hmm. in my, in the duration of school. And I was just really stuck on my grades just between 11 and 12. Prior to that, like I had no work ethic. So it was just, it was all over the shop. Little rebel. And I was, rebel yeah, I was a little making. bit, yeah. So like in primary school and grade between eight to 10, I was just, I didn't give a crap. Like it was, I would hang out with the around with the Aboriginal kids because they, I kind of felt welcomed with them because I never fit in like, and I would always try to fit in and I just, you know, I'd, I'd get bullied crazy. So I just felt accepted with them. And then being in that environment prior to that, like it was just, you know, we were egging houses, we were, you know, just doing street runs, rocking roofs and just doing all the, you know, stupid shit. All the rebel things. Yeah. 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 So when I moved back to Ipswich um, in grade 11, it was just a different change of environment and something just switched to me and I was like, all right, like, what do I actually want out of life? Like, what do, what do I, you know, where do I want to go? You know, um, do I, do I want to be a bum and be on Centrelink and like have kids and, you know, like be struggling? No. So I, um, it just switched to me and then I really just started to knuckle down grade 11 and 12 on my, on my studies. And I was even spending, you know, my lunch breaks, just working on my assignments just to be ahead and be ahead so much that mum would come pick me up early from school in the afternoon just so I could race to the gym and just get in my like my usual routine and and my workout and then so I started you know I was at the gym and I was, I was training for a good like probably even three hours or so doing like the Les Mill classes and just endless amounts of cardio and then I would go on the weights room a little bit and just do a little bit of leg extensions and leg press and yeah. just watch the boys in there and see what they were doing and then <laughs> and then yeah, but it became such a bad, um, unhealthy obsession that I was I wasn't eating right. I wasn't eating right to fuel my body, and um, I had a lot of girls even at school, like ones that were, were you know mean to me, little bitches to me, would be like, "Oh, you're starting to look really good. You're starting to look, you know, you're skinny. Oh, you've got a thigh gap. Like, mm-hmm. I like your legs." And I just got obsessed with that, mm-hmm. and like I started to feel like, "Oh, you know, like I feel it. I thrived off that." And then, so I wanted to be, get more skinny. Like I just, I just, I craved that yeah. and then having that attention. So then it got so worse over the years while I was in high school that I would be, you know, I'd, I'd start binge eating cause I was starving. Like I was just starving myself, but then I, I'd make myself sick after mm-hmm. it was just a constant cycle, like backwards and forwards. And then my lowest weight, I did drop to about 45 kilos and I look, I look sick. And, um, like my arms and my legs were just like little sticks, which I'll have to show you guys a photo. Um, but it, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And then I think at one moment 
I was doing one of my classes and I remember like I was in the midst of doing some like body pump class and my hip popped out, something severe happened or I tore something, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, that resonated with me and I was like, well, shit, like, what am I going to do now? Like, I can't do my routine stuff. I can't do my crazy cardio. Like, how am I going to eat? Like, Mm. I just, it was, yeah, it, it dwelled on me for ages. And then I then started to get a little bit more of an interest in weight training and training a little bit more upper body just mm-hmm. for to do something. Well, you, and couldn't, you couldn't do lower body, right? With no, like, with I couldn't do issue. anything. I, so I, like, to, I could not walk. Like yeah. I couldn't even walk. I couldn't even run. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would, I'd run like 10 Ks on the treadmill, like every morning. Like that was, that was my thing. And then once I had that injury, I was like, well, I try to reach out to a few of my like gym buddies in the gym that were already doing weight training and just see if I could jump in a few sets and train with them and stuff Mm -hmm. like that and Mm -hmm. try to learn some stuff. And I remember in the midst of that, I seen these two girls in the front of the gym and they were in bikinis and they were posing. And I was like, I I would just watch them and I would just look at them and be like, you know, like one day I want to like, I want to do that. Like they just look so glamorous and like beautiful. And like, I just, I, I idolized that. And it was, you know, just something different. And it wasn't until I actually asked for help and, you know, reached out to the coach I've had for the last, you know, uh, f- five, six years, which is Amory Lassere. Mm-hmm. I met her and, you know, reached out to her and, and, you know, it took, it took, it took a good amount of time to like turn my lifestyle around and, you know, try turn my obsession into like a little bit more of a healthy obsession, yeah. you know, um, so I'd use that passion and that obsession to then go into competing. And, you know, with her help, I was starting to have a bit more of a set meal plan on, plan on like what to eat, how to actually fuel my body rather than punish my body and starve and, you know, and train right for my body. So when my injury did start to recover, I then started to do a little bit more weight training in my lower half and... I had like a good, probably a good year or so of just like weight training and then eating consistently. And then my coach was like, all right, like you're going to do your first comp, you know. And my first show was NABBA slash WFF in um, Townsville. So it was um, traveled there and we probably had about like eight or 10 girls on stage. And I remember just coming out and it was just, it was like your words just can't explain. Like when I did even the whole entire prep, the first ever prep, I was so absolutely dedicated to the gram, like with everything, I feel it, everything to the T. And I was just so excited to like put on one of those bikinis and just get glammed up and just, just experience all of that. And then when I did my first show, I placed first in um, fitness for NABBA. And then after that, Emery's like, okay, right, you're going to go to, you're going to do WBFF. It's like a week after, like, let's get you ready for that. So then I entered into the WBFF, um, did bikini category, and then I placed third in that. And it was just like mind blowing. And I think my, when my mom saw that, she was just like, right. Okay. Like now I know why she's so obsessed with training and, and everything like, and that from there, I was just like, all right, this is my passion. Like, I just, I love it so much. And then I was like, then advised to have like a good, you know, another year or so off. Cause then I, I kind of wanted to like get bigger, like grow. I don't, I wanted to grow. grow. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, put on some size and things like that. So it was such a, different um mindset from coming so you know under eating and starving myself being really skinny to then be like now I need to grow I need to make improvements Mm -hmm. in my off season after show to then want to do my next show because I was just so obsessed with getting getting back on stage so I had like almost about a year off and then I you know didn't I did my next show after that and my next show after that I've been competing like consistently since I turned pro um, yeah, for the last like five or six years, I pretty much did a show every single year. Mm-hmm. And my mum was always my um, biggest supporter. Um, my two, tw- my two twin brothers, my younger brothers, they were never into gym and stuff like that. So this was just always my thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she was, she was there every single show. She always supported me. She was always my rock. Even when I did like, I did have some bad shows, you know, um, which I probably just didn't give my body enough of a break. And, you know, I was in shitty relationships and things at the time. So I was, you know, a bit stressed out. But, you know, eventually I was just I was just so set on a mission that I just didn't stop. So every single year I wanted to try and be a bit better and better and better. 
And, you know, at the end of the day, it was just, it was just improving my, myself and just wanting to become something and be a better version of myself. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to, um, I want to take some, some dive into your story, right? Because yeah. one of the things that, uh, that I know about you, that you <laughs> kind of skimmed over the surface, right? Is yeah. kind of your, your younger years, right? So you talk, yeah. you talk a lot about your mom. You just mentioned that you have, uh, younger twin brothers. Yes, so yeah. you, you've got uh, two siblings. You're the eldest yeah. twin brothers younger than you. How young are your twin? How much younger are you twin um, brothers? I think they're 23. Okay. So a couple of years, <laughs> couple of years younger. <laughs> I'm, I'm bad memory. I think they're yeah, 23. Right? Yeah. Right? You talk, and you talk a lot about your mum, and obviously you have an amazing relationship with your mum. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit as we kind of go down your competing journey. Mm. But you... You know, as a young girl, you experienced some trauma. Am I right? In, yeah. In, in your family life. Like, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I know everyone goes through stuff and I mean, I definitely have my fair share. There's, I mean, there's some things I probably like I wouldn't mention and there is some things I, you know, I'm, I'm so open to talk about because I think you just forgive and forget and you learn from that experience. But um, most of, most of um, when I was younger, um, the reason I don't really talk about my dad much was just because he was never really, he was never really there. Like he was never really in my life. So I think the last time I seen him was probably like when I was six or eight years old. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, like the only memories I do have of him was just being abusive to my mom, being a really bad alcoholic, um, and just smashing up stuff and making threats to my mom. Like he was going to put the cat in the microwave and he was just, he was messed up, you know? And, um, a lot of that you know, it stayed with me. And I think, you know, I look up to my mom now that she's, you know, she's such a independent woman and with all the shit that she's been through and then raising me and my brothers, you know, she, we had it tough. We literally come from nothing. Like we had nothing. Your mom was on Centrelink. We were just moving from house to house. That's why I've kind of just been all over the shop. Like, you know, all the last few years when I was growing up. How many times did you move during your childhood that you can remember? Probably, oh, probably a good, like, m- maybe three or four times, yeah. probably four times. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just been a big roller coaster since then. Um, but you know, like I'd look at her and I think when things started to switch for me, I just, I wanted to make mom proud. I wanted to just do something in the family and, and be that, you know, that one that, you know, everyone's proud of, of like, you know, I've turned things around in the family and, and just, you know, Someone that, you know, like while my mom's around, I wanted to do that while I was young. Yeah. Um, so the last, like when I was competing show after show after show, like I wanted to obviously make a career out of it and things like that. And I wanted to do it whilst my mom was around because, you know, she's always been there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I haven't seen my dad since I was, you know, yeah, six, six eight years old. Um, and I think looking back, I just didn't want that life for myself. So even now, so, you know, I try strive to be better. Mm-hmm. I don't put up with shit from men, like, <laughs> or in general, I don't put up with shit. So yeah. I just, you know, I do my own thing. And if I want something really bad in life, like I'll go for it, I'll work for it. Um, just so I can live a bit more of a comfortable life now, because, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely, it was definitely rough growing up. Let, so. me, let me ask you um, a difficult question and, and something that I think that a lot of the listeners and a lot of the viewers will be able to resonate with, right? Yeah. Because a lot of us, you know, we, no one really has an ideal childhood, right? No, there's, no. there's things that, that don't go to plan. There's um, broken families. Mm-hmm. There's different levels of trauma that, you know, all of us have experienced in our, in our yeah. childhood and what you kind of went through, you know, we spoke a little bit off camera. I know there's certain things you want to mention, there's yeah, certain things yeah. you don't want to mention, yeah. But you went through some pretty heavy shit, yeah. right? At a really young age as well. And the yeah. sort of thing that, you know, can can scar you yeah. for, for a lifetime. And you yeah. mentioned that you kind of went through a little bit of a, a rebel phase, a rebellion yeah, phase, so hanging had, around yeah, with, the, with the, you know, yeah. the wrong types of people and doing the wrong types yeah. of things and that sort of thing. Yeah. How did you pull yourself out of that? And how did you switch your mindset from you know, the kind of victim mentality, I've gone through this shit, yeah. um, I'm going to rebel against it, you know, yeah. this isn't fair, and, and all of those sorts of um, negative affirmations that come along with it. How did mm. you flip the switch or how did you get yourself into a mindset where it was like, no, you know what, I'm actually going to use this as fuel yeah. to do something with, with my life. life. Yeah. Um, I think it was when we had our last move and 
the environment I was in. Mm. And that's one thing I, I preach big now is, you know, if you surround yourself with shit, you're going to become shit. So 100%. I think a lot of the kids I was with um, in my rebellious, you know, age, like they, they weren't striving to be anything. And I think like once we moved, it was a different environment. And I finished like my last years of high school. I was just, you know, I, I asked myself, like, I mean, where am I going to be in the next, you know, four or five years? Like, what do I actually want out of life? So I had to, I just, I just had to be the one to just, just basically to snap myself out of it. I, I did. Yeah. I just blocked a lot of people out of my life. Um, and I kind of just shut off. And the only thing that mattered to me was, you know, I was doing things that were productive. I thought in, at the time, like, if it didn't bring value, it wasn't productive, like, I didn't want it. And, yeah, I think it was just the environment I was in. So once I took myself out of that environment, it was kind of a good re refresh and restart yeah. for myself. And, you know, when I went to a new school, no one didn't, like, no one knew me, no one knew my history or anything like that. So it was just a good, like, you know, new chapter. So I think when you're struggling with things in life or, you know, the environment that you're in isn't good or you're not happy or you, it's not taking you to the places where you want to be, you got to just learn to put yourself first and make yourself a priority and do what you need to do. You know, you got to be selfish and, you know, just to get yourself ahead. So if you got to do that, you got to change your environment, you got to change your mentality as well. And, and rather than, you know, being sorry for yourself, turn it around and make it into something positive and yeah, like use it as fuel to yeah. what you want to be and what you want to do in your life. It's such an important uh, thing to note, Jacinda, is, you know, one of the things that I see a lot is often people will have the intention, right, to, mm -hmm. to level up, right? So perhaps they're in, a, they're in a dark place and they're like, you know, they're just at a point where they're just sick of it, you know, like I'm just sick of being in here. I want to do something with my life. I want to um, put positive changes in place. Or the other situation is they're in a certain, they're achieving a certain level of success and they're trying to get to the next level. They're trying to level up. Yeah. Right. So the intention is there yeah. and often the mindset's there as well. And what I see stops them is the environment. Yeah. And, and the environment often in particular are the people that they associate with. Yeah, it is. And yeah. it's one of the hardest things to go, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to break away here. I'm trying yeah. to get myself out of this position I'm in, out of this hole I'm in, or I'm trying to get to the next level. Yeah. And the one thing that's holding them back is the people they associate yeah, with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think no matter what, like if you have true friends and things in life, like they'll support you no matter what. So, you know, sometimes you, you, you can't feel bad for that. So if you do have to be selfish, like, you know, you, you can't feel bad for that. And, and the people that are actually, you know, really in your life for a reason to add value and support you, like it, it won't matter to them. They'll, they'll support you either way. So if you need to take yourself self out of that environment to then progress and level up or, yeah. you know, you're, you're in a bad relationship and you feel bad to, you know, break things off with that person, like, unfortunately like you just got to do what you got to do you know and when you're in that right mindset and that environment good things will come in your life and you you know you're trying to you know new pages will come like new, it'll be a new chapter for yourself you know so well, this and this is the thing right is you you need to create space yeah you need to create a void like yeah. if you're if you're trying to level up you're trying to change your life you're trying yeah. to attract a new environment you're trying to attract new people yeah. that are going to help you get to that next level yeah. if you're at maximum capacity right mm. there's no space for those people to come into your life yeah exactly right you need yeah. to you need to purposely create that space purposely create that void yeah. to allow space for the universe to bring you people yeah. into your you, life yeah. environments into your life experiences into your life that yeah. are going to help you get to the next level it's 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 it's, it's all self development you know yeah. and it's just like sometimes you you outgrow people as well yeah. You know, and it's it's funny that I used to all my years in like high school try and impress these people that were not even my friends. Mm -hmm. And then it's like I look back and it's like, you know, these people aren't even going to matter in my life in the next, you know, three, four years. Like, what does it even matter? So like even now in life, I just learned to, you know, I accepted that people will come and go in my life and I don't have expectations at all with anyone. Yeah. And everyone will come into your life for a reason. Like everything's a learning lesson. And the true friends that, you know, or loved ones that really stick around that, you know, they're the ones that have your back and they're the ones that I really do really appreciate, you know. 
but it's all just with time. And yeah, you just got to do what you got to do for yourself. So mm. yeah, it's 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 incredible um, insight for somebody so young. To yeah, have that because like to be honest, it's something that I really probably didn't realize and definitely didn't appreciate until my early thirties. Mm. I reckon uh, is when I where it kind of clicked <laughs> clicked for me, and I was like, you know what? I've been, hang, like- I've been hanging around <laughs> in the same environment yeah. with the same people. And I just can't level up. Like I'm trying to get to the next level and I can't do it. And that's when it kind of clicked to me. I'm like, you know what? Uh, As bad as it, it almost sounds selfish. Like when you articulate it, right? But at the end of the day, if you're trying to do something with your life, you're like, you have to, right? Mm. There's there's just no other option. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit. You mentioned that when you, when you first made that shift in mindset, right? Yeah. And you, one of the things that you kind of got into at that point was gym yeah. and fitness, a lot of cardio based fitness, a lot of, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. you're trying to get skinny, right? Yeah. That was kind of the goal, <laughs> yeah. you know, starving yourself or, or at very best underfeeding yourself mm. and kind of developing, I guess, this unhealthy obsession, obsession with yeah. fitness. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I do see quite frequently, you know, definitely, yes, yeah. with, definitely with females when they yeah. first get into fitness, it's usually, it's, it's usually the same. It's stigma. usually, yeah, it's usually weight loss related yeah. and it's just like, you know, it, it can very quickly turn into an unhealthy obsession. It does. Yeah. With guys, it's usually the opposite. It's the opposite. Right? They're, they're chilled. Guys they're just like, just, I just want to get they're big. They're trying to get as yeah. big as possible, yeah. you know, and they're force feeding themselves. Yeah. And so on one hand, generally speaking, and there are overlaps, there are, you know, outliers, yeah. but generally yeah. speaking, you have the girl that are really overtraining, under eating yeah. and putting themselves in this unhealthy obsession of starving themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With guys, they're kind of under training, over eating, yeah, <laughs> putting it's, themselves it's in, this, in this obsession yeah. where they're, you know, it's unhealthy as well. It's just yeah. in the opposite direction. They're both, I mean, they're both, yeah, they're both unhealthy, but yeah. I think it's sad that, you know, that, I mean, that all, that all occurred to me when, um you know, like you'd see models in magazines and it's just like, you know, Victoria's Secret, you got to be stick thin, you know. I do love the fact of how it's changed now modern days that, you know, we're embracing more curves and fullness and just to look like a freaking woman. Like, yeah. I love that, you know. And I still have girls now that, you know, come to me and be like, oh, how to lose my inner thigh fat yeah. or like, you know, they have had eating eating issues and well, stuff you, like you that. Have, you have the so experience now that, that, yeah, that, I've that had you that. went through, right, yeah. when you were like 17, 18, yeah, 19. Yeah, I've been through all that shit. And now you see it in your work, right, yeah, as I'm sure that you still. see clients come through with mm-hmm. that, that same mindset. So yeah. based on your personal experience and then based on what you see through your work, mm. what advice can you give you know, if there's there's people listening, people watching at the moment that have perhaps, you know, found themselves in that negative obsession, yeah. perhaps it's weight loss related, perhaps it's muscle gain or yeah. weight gain related. What advice can you give to really kind of flip the switch on that obsession and kind of get back to the healthy side yeah. of fitness? Doing it for the right reasons. I think the best thing, honestly, is just like ask for help. Like, don't be afraid to speak up for it because mine went on for so many years and I didn't ask for any advice or anything. Well, it was really when, when you and crossed paths with like, Anne-Marie, right? Yeah. That was the, that was, that was the yeah. switch for me just to, you know, actually have someone that I can trust mm-hmm. and I can talk to and feel comfortable about these things, you mm-hmm. know? And that's why I really pride on myself now, like working with clients that are like one-on-one because I build that relationship with them. And, you know, they tell me if they've had a bad week or if, if I've had one of my clients that she's been with me the last year or so, she'll, she'll just put, put me aside and be like, look, I've I've had a bad week of like binge eating and stuff like that. And now I'm starving myself. And I'll be like, well, you know, because I've had that experience and stuff like that. I will try and switch their mindset and, you know, make sure they leave feeling better about themselves and, and back on track. But the best thing is just don't be afraid to speak up and, and ask for guidance. You know, there's so much misleading crap there out on the internet too, which it can make it confusing on what to follow, what's good for you and what's not good to you. But I think just find a coach that, you know, you can relate to, that you you feel comfortable with and that you can trust and just ask for some help and speak up about it. Same with guys. I think guys don't ask for enough advice at all. You know, sometimes they're bad enough to go to the doctor when they're sick, like they just don't care. So I think no matter what, just, yeah, reach out to someone and, um, someone that you can trust to better guide you so you're not just winging it and give you a little bit more of a purpose to train um, in a, a little bit more of a healthy matter than it turning into a bad obsession. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think it's really one of those areas where seeking out 
experience yeah. is is such a big deal, you yeah. know, from people who have experience in fitness because a lot of the times we mm. uncover stories like yourself, right? Mm. Is that it's it's yeah. it really is not uncommon. It's yeah. definitely much more frequent than you, than you think. Is, it is yeah. you know you see these top level professional athletes, right, who have achieved these awesome things and yeah. have this amazing physique and know how to do it healthily, mm. but often the introduction to fitness was the complete it opposite. Has, yeah, there's always a story. There's, there's always, always something behind there's it. There's always yeah. something behind it, right? Yeah. So yeah. you know, guys, if you find yourself in the situation where you have found fitness which yeah. is awesome, yes. right? Yeah. But your obsession, your, your, your um, uh, fitness has turned into an obsession yeah. and it's becoming not a healthy obsession. Yeah. That's when it's time to, you know, reach out, seek advice yeah. um, from from someone who has a bunch of experience in fitness because yeah. more often than not, they will have seen your situation before. Yes, and they exactly. And can, can help guide can you. Can better guide you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, can help guide you through it. Yeah, definitely. Let's um, switch, well, we're kind of in the same gear, but switch gears a little bit because I just want to talk about your business yeah. in particular, right? So you mentioned coming up last few years of high school, yeah, you started yeah. studying, you were going to be a beautician, yeah. right? That was kind of where you wanted to go. And then you found and this- then it's which, obsession yeah. with fitness that turned into a, a very healthy passion yes, with yeah. fitness and you kind of change gears there as well. Yeah. Um, firstly, I want you to talk to me about how that passion developed, right? And yeah. how you lent into that, to that passion, because a lot of the times people find themselves in a situation where they're going down a particular path mm. that they thought was the path that they wanted to yeah. go down. And then something piques their interest yep. and grabs their curiosity and they're like, oh shit, actually I might want to change lanes here or change direction and maybe go and pursue this passion. So yeah. I want you to talk us through that um, first and foremost. Mm, yeah. So like, I mean, when I was starting to be a beautician, you know, it took me about two years to mm. like finish my certs and things like that. And as I was saying, like, I just, I fell out of the industry and at, at the time, like even while I was studying and I was doing school and then training, I just really just had such an interest to like, you know, I'm so obsessed with gym and training. Like I gotta, I gotta turn this into something that, you know, it's, it's gotta be my daily job, mm -hmm. you know, like I just was never, I'm never sick of it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Like I love training, like, and I love training people, you know? So I kind of felt, I felt bad at the time because I know my mom put in a lot of money, you know, to help me with my certs to be a beauty, beauty therapist. Well, you, you, but were, you were invested at that point. Yeah, right? I was, I was yeah. There was a time investment. Yeah, and I was, an I was scared, investment. yeah. And, yeah. I felt, and I felt bad and I was scared to like, okay, like I want to completely change my path. Mm. Um, but I mean, sometimes in life you just got to do stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable. So mm. that's what I did. And I think, you know, my mom, my mom definitely agreed over time. So you know, just because she could see how obsessed I was with it. So I started doing all my my studies into fitness and certs and things like that. And then whilst I met my coach, Emery, I then started to work in a supplement store. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was it was just a complete turnaround from there. I just loved it. And then once I did, you know, finished all my studying and things like that, I started off in a small gym called um, Snap Fitness mm -hmm. um, in Browns Plains. And I was charging, you know, $30 for a 30 minute session. I was also like, there was another PT there. And I remember trying to like make mine discounted. So people yeah, would come yeah. see me Undercut. more. Like yeah. I was like, I'm cheaper, but like, you know, but, and then, um, you know, that doesn't work. Yeah, in but it now, doesn't. Right? And it yeah. doesn't. Yeah. And then over the years, I was just like, you know, you learn and stuff like that. But, you know, business just started to build from there. And I was just doing, you know, face to face clients and things like that and then helping them with their nutrition and guidance and, and their diet and then at the same time I was competing and things myself throughout yeah. the years so after a while um I then went to move to a bigger commercial gym which I'm still at now mm -hmm. which is um good life browns plants and I any of a lot of my clients that were from Snap actually moved over with me, mm. and I then just build my continued to build my base up of clientele um, from Good Life, and you know I'm so known that I'm just so comfortable that like you know the staff literally let me do whatever. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty pretty much the one that's in there like almost twenty four seven like Monday to Friday. I'm just I'm always there like I basically live there, mm. and I just I bloody love it. Like it's I I honestly. Could not see myself doing anything else. So you're happy with the decision I'm so, you made, right? I'm so happy. To move like, away from so glad, what, you, yeah. what you thought you wanted to do to, yeah. to what you really wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. And yeah, I was shit scared. Like, 
you know, wanting to actually train people and work with people because I was so introverted. I had no social skills. I had such bad body dysmorphia. I had no self-confidence. So I was really scared to like throw myself in the deep end and like to start working with people, even people that are like twice my age mm. and to tell them what to do and then to, you know, to help them. But how did you, how did you deal with that fear, with that discomfort? What was the, you know, how, how literally did, like just throwing myself in the deep end. Yeah. Like I had to, like, I was like, okay, I'm here now. Like once I finished my search, I was like, I gotta, I gotta make do. I've gotta, I gotta get, I gotta build my business up now. Mm -hmm. Like this is where I'm going to make, you know, ends meet mm -hmm. and, you know, build my future with. So I think it was just something that I just, I jumped straight into. Yeah. Um, and then with time, I just started to get a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable. And, um, I started to make a little bit more better money and then I started upping my prices and stuff like that. And, you know, then I, then I bought my first car and like, I just did these little achievements for myself that, you know, with no handouts, no, no rich parents, like nothing. I just, I did it all myself. And then, you know, when I started to come more successful at Good Life, um, you know, I now charge $60 a session for 30 minutes and I do about anywhere between 50 to 60 sessions a week. So it's, a lot it's, of it's good. <laughs> it's good. And I, you know, like I do all my clients and every single one of them, like some of them, you know, have been seeing me for three years. So mm. sometimes, you know, it's not just about training, but it's, it's mindset as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I might come in and they might need that pep talk and they might need that, you know, that, that motivational pickup. Yeah. So that's why I'm really big on doing um, face to face sessions and things like that. And mm. I just want to make such a big positive impact on everyone that, you know, I touch base with. Mm. So if I can do that, then I'm happy. It's one of those things that I talk about quite frequently is mm. what do you do in the face of fear? Because yeah. there's, there's two options, right? And <laughs> when people confront something that's scary or uncomfortable or fear in general, F-E-A-R. Yeah. And I use yeah. that acronym F-E-A-R because you've got two options, right? On one hand, you can forget everything and run, yeah. which is what a lot of people do. Yeah. It's too scary. It's too uncomfortable. Not going to do it. Going to yeah. either stay in my comfort zone or just going to yeah. turn around and go another direction. Yeah. Or- you just you run can, towards it. You can face everything yeah. and rise. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you mentioned that you just took the jump, right? It's yeah. like, it's scary. It it's was, uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a lot of fear associated with it, but whatever, I'm just going to face it. I'm just going to jump do in. It. And often what happens when mm. you confront those uncomfortable situations, when you choose to face everything and rise, mm. that's exactly what happens. Yeah. You dive in, you don't know what you're doing, you but it. you figure it out. Yeah. You just go right? from you it. Rise you rise know. to the situation. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do you still put yourself in uncomfortable situations? I do. At the moment, no, because, you know, we, we're kind of restricted on what we can do and travel and things like that. So mm -hmm. there is still some things that I really want to do that do scare me, yeah. which is traveling in, in, like internationally and, and exploring a little bit more and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but at the moment, I'm so content and happy with what I do. I'm just like work, train, work, train mm. and... And, you know, working towards, you know, my, my, my future goals and things like that. But I love challenges. Mm. Like at the moment I'm, I'm pretty bored with life. Like I need, I need my next challenge. I'm so I gonna, need something. I'm just going to bring something up because <laughs> this is, you know, this is something that, um, this is not uncommon amongst mm. high achievers, right? Mm. Is that we tend to put ourselves in challenging situations or uncomfortable situations yeah. and we don't even notice no. because you and I were having a discussion on mm -hmm. the couch <laughs> here earlier at Massive yeah. headquarters yeah. and you were telling me about cryotherapy, oh. <laughs> right? And, yeah. and I was, I was, yeah, and then I started talking about like, I take a cold shower every morning yeah. right? and we started trading these stories about yeah. these, just these little, just little things, little discomfort, right? Little yeah. uncomfortable situations yeah. that we do that yeah. are really uncomfortable and really shit. Yeah. And you were talking about the cryotherapy and you bloody, <laughs> Yeah, I got blisters. Yeah, you know, so you do, you yeah. do put yourself in a comfortable situation. Little, yeah. You don't even notice. There's little things like even I was just started recently taking up boxing yeah. because I was like, well, that's a challenge. I want to learn something new. Yeah. But one philosophy that I think that stayed with me heaps is if it doesn't make you uncomfortable, or if there is not a challenge in life, like you're not going to progress. Yeah, it's the same with training too, or when I train clients, I teach them like, it's, it's going to be hard. It's progressive overload. Yeah. If it's not hard and it's not challenging you, yeah. it's not going to do shit. Yeah. So I live with that in my life too, that, you know, like I constantly need some sort of like, 
you know, I need a challenge. I need mm. I need something to kind of keep me excited. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah, life life is boring. Like my life is a little bit, you know, constant cycle right now. But yeah, at the moment I've, I've taken up, you know, boxing and I'm going to do a Spartan race at the end of um, May, which is, I think it's just a little one, which I've, I've done it before, but I love the challenge of it because you feel like you're going to die. Yeah. But I just, I live with that philosophy now and I just, I love challenges in life and mm. just different stuff as well. Yeah, it's uh, something that I'm I'm a massive, massive advocate for. Jacinda is purposely seeking out and purposely putting yourself in uncomfortable situations yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah, because there's there's a couple of reasons why I'm a massive advocate for that, and I'll, I'll tell you something that I do that I've never spoken publicly about, <laughs> but it's relevant, so I'll bring <laughs> it up. But there's a couple of reasons why, right? Mm. Firstly, is we're familiar with progressive overload in the gym, right? Yeah. You mentioned it. If yeah. you're not pushing your body, if you're not pushing more weight, more reps, yeah. you're going to stop growing, right? Yeah. Progressive overload. That's how you grow. That's how yeah. you develop. Progressive overload applies to all areas of life. Yeah. If you're not pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, it's not going to change. You're going to stay exactly the same, the same right? The same, yeah. So you don't progress. That's the first thing. Mm. The second thing is you get comfortable with being comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as yeah. you get comfortable with being comfortable, it becomes more and more difficult to become uncomfortable, yeah. to seek out discomfort. Yeah. And if it becomes more difficult to seek out discomfort, mm. it becomes more good, difficult to progress. Yeah, so does. you kind of, it almost starts to it's snowball in the opposite direction yeah. of, man, I'm so comfortable. I can't actually remember what it feels like to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And if you can't remember what it feels like to be uncomfortable, you <laughs> are in a very bad situation yeah. when it comes to to progressing and trying to level up. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. one of the things I do, I have, um, uh, what I call my top five, right? So mm. every day, Monday through to Sunday for the week, I have a, a list. It's literally, it's not this diary. It's a different diary, mm. but it's, it's got, um, each day of the week. And then I have five things, right? So I have, I call it my top five. So I have three major tasks. Mm. Then I have one uncomfortable task and yeah. then I have one, kindness or yeah. something empathetic, something kind that I'm going to do. And so each day the goal is to get those top three tasks done, to do something, yeah. to do something that makes me uncomfortable every mm. single day mm. and to do something kind for somebody else. That's my That's top okay. five. Yeah. And I do it every single day. I like that. So it's like a set plan, you know what I mean? And I'm purposely yeah. seek, even if there's nothing on my plate mm. that for that particular day that I'm like, you know what, that makes me uncomfortable. I, you know, that's going to be tough. I'll yeah. find something that is. Yeah. I'll go and send that email that I've been putting off. Yeah. I'll make that phone call that I've been, yeah. that I need to return. That's not a conversation. I'll go have that conversation with one of my employees who's been underperforming or hasn't been performing to the level I know they can yeah. perform. I'll go and do something that makes me uncomfortable yeah. because I'm training that that muscle yeah. that's going to help me progress and level it's up. It's just mindset. It's, and then from there, it's just making progress. Yeah. You know what I mean? 100%. Or what you can do better or learn from that experience, yeah. you know? And I think the best thing to do too is like my mentality is I don't want to sit there and, and think, oh, what if, you know, yeah. if, I, if I didn't go in my comfort zone and do it, like I would rather do it and try than like live with regret and be like, mm. oh, what if I, you know, you would never know. Like what if, what if I didn't do that? You know, what if something positive came out of it? Yeah. You know, if it's negative, whatever, then learn from it and then do what you can next time to make it better. Yeah. But yeah, that, I like that. It's good. Yeah. It's my, one of my little, um, <laughs> there you go. That's the practical and strategic <laughs> advice right there yeah. for the listeners and the viewers. Um, let's go real practical business mm. because we do have a lot of listeners and a lot of viewers who work in the fitness space. Perhaps they're personal trainers, perhaps they're coaches, perhaps they're not, but they want to be. Yeah. Building a personal training business, building a coaching business from the ground up as you have is really it's hard. hard. It's hard. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. And I can count probably 20 people for every one person who's been successful. I can count yeah. 20 who haven't. Yeah. So how did you do it? What was your, cause you started from zero. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you do. had yeah. no, you didn't buy a client base. No. You literally went into snap fitness <laughs> and gym. you tried to un- undercut the other PT. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> start was from the bottom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, you know, if, if you're talking to personal trainers, coaches or aspiring personal trainers and coaches, what are your top business tiers? build your business. personal training or your coaching business from the ground up? What have you done that's worked for you? Um, well, yeah, I, d- I get, I get a lot of, I do get a lot of um, trainers and things that are new to business and starting out and stuff like that. And I don't sugarcoat things. Like I do tell them like, look, it's going to be, it's going to be fucking hard. And starting any it's business not, is hard. Yeah. Just starting any business. From the ground up yeah, is, is it's, a it's lot it's harder than people. Difficult. The, the mindset, the unrealistic expectation is that you, yeah. you 
click your fingers and you decide that I'm going to be a business person, a business owner, and then suddenly the universe opens up and all of this business comes your way. It just comes in. No, but but it doesn't. And and like reality check, like I have a lot of trainers be like, oh, I mean, they'll say some nice things. They'll be like, you know, you inspire me. I want to do what you do and things like that. And it's all great and all. And they'll look at like, oh, how much money I make and stuff. But I'm like, look, like the, the root of it all, like it started and it took freaking years and a Mm. lot of work and Mm. the thing is i think because i was so obsessed with it i was constantly there and around it all the time so i was always in the gym Mm. and i think the best thing to do is like no what whatever business you're trying to aspire to or build is to be constantly you know active on it and immerse yourself in the community constantly like daily Mm. you know what i mean um and then in the fitness industry you know um, being being online, being you know active on social media and mm-hmm. things like that, posting heaps of content. Yeah. Um, and find your own niche. Like mm-hmm. find something that you can offer that's different and unique from everyone else because yeah. everyone just tries to do the same shit. So people are gonna like you for you and like what you can offer. And you know, if you can make them feel a certain way or make them you know feel different, like they're gonna they're gonna come for you for a, for a certain reason. You know. Yeah. So stay true to yourself and be yourself. Like you don't have to put a front on, you know, on your Instagram stories or act fake or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like just be mm-hmm. yourself and be constantly around it just to, you know, help, you know, build, mm-hmm. build, build, build. Um, but be patient as well because it, it does. It takes, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and things like that. Yeah. A lot more time and effort than you initially think. Right? Yeah, it does. Always. Yeah. yeah. I think that's such great advice for, for any business, right? Is mm. what you mentioned about, you know, finding your niche, finding your unique selling point, finding yeah. something that you do that no well, one that no one else yeah. can do. And the reason why that's so important in any business is if you're offering the exact same products, the exact same service, yeah. the exact same business as your competitor, yeah. the only thing you can compete on is price. Yeah, exactly. And you, learned that and you don't, early you don't on, want right? to make that mistake. You're doing yeah. 30 minute sessions for 15 <laughs> yeah. bucks by the time yeah. you yeah, undercut everyone. It's not, yeah, it's right? not and it's, it, yeah. it's, it's a race to the bottom at that point, right? You yeah. have to find something else to compete on that's not price related. Yeah. So when you say f- when you say find your niche, that's exactly what yeah. it is, right? Find the the little part of the industry that you are starting your business in yeah. that no one has looked at an opportunity. Yeah, to exist. Yeah, yeah. No one has squeezed that opportunity. Yeah. Nobody has added value in that area. Nobody no, exactly. has um looked at the looked at outside the box mm. like you're having to look at now. Yeah. And you really, you know, especially when you're starting a business, you need to find those little deltas where you can add value yeah that is something that your That's competitors unique. are not doing yeah it's that different. is unique yeah. yeah and then you get yourself out of this shit situation where you're competing mm. on price you get to a situation where you're at right yeah. where you're like well i can charge a little bit more I can yeah charge yeah a little bit more i can charge a little bit more i know you're worth you know and that's how you build a business yeah. mm-hmm. right you don't build a business by competing on price Mm-mm. i think it's a huge mistake that no, people especially no. people new to don't business, undercut don't yourself 100 you know? and if you know what you can you can what you can offer and the value you can offer then you know it's Set those standards, set that price and be confident in yourself as well. Um, Because sometimes you you just, people, they might back, they might backtrack themselves. They might not believe in themselves Mm. and stuff enough. So you're really going to put yourself out there and just be like, you know what, I can do this. I know what I can offer. Yeah. um, And try to set yourself above the rest. Mm. Yeah. And all your competitors and things like that. Yeah. Let's talk competing real quick. Mm. Because you 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 skimmed over your competing journey. You started in NABA, right? Yeah. You did well in fitness. Yeah. You went to WBFF. Yeah. Did well in bikini. Yeah. Then you've come across the IFBB. What did you? What division did you start in with IFBB? So, I was just prior to that. I thought I th- I think I did my fourth WBFF show, and yeah. I was constantly tossing up between. You know, I couldn't do figure. Yeah. Because I felt like I was probably not big enough for figure. Yes. And, you know, obviously I'm too big for bikini and yeah. I like lifting heavy weights. So, yeah. you know, like that, that's my thing. I, I don't train like a bikini girl. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until um, 2019, just like perfect timing. Like I finished my uh, season A show for WBFF. After that, I was just like, you know, I, I didn't place. It was a bad, it was a bad placing. Mm-hmm. I think I got top five and I was mm-hmm. just like, what do I do? Like, what can I do? You know, it's just until they announced for IFB. Um, pro league that they will bring up wellness. Yeah. 
And I, I obviously knew of this category from overseas because mm. I obviously like I idolized the girls over there and I was just like I love the I love the look, I love the shape, it's yeah. really womanly and I love like, you know, my obsession with training legs just grew. Yeah. Because it's uncomfortable mm-hmm. and that's why I love it. And um, when they announced the category, it was it was really perfect timing. I they were gonna do so obviously season B is around um, October time mm-hmm. and I didn't have much of a period from season A to season B to then be like, okay, I'm going to transition into this. So I did a bit, a little bit of a, a reverse diet and then yeah. I, I was back on prep again. Straight in. And I was like, just give it a shot. Yeah, like yeah. it was, it was, you know, again, out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Completely different to what I was used to because yeah. WBFF is really like modelly and mm. glamorous and stuff like that. Whereas this is like proper like bodybuilding. Proper physique. But yeah. P- p- yeah. Physique focused. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I was, I was hella scared, but I was like, let's just give it a shot. Yeah. And I remember, yeah, I, I did it and I turned, I, I won. It was, yeah. you know, it was the first one being announced for a pro card yeah. division first in Australia. Mm-hmm. And I remember and this, is, this is, this is 2000 because I have, 2019. I have, I have fond memories of, of this show real quick <laughs> yeah. before we get there. It's interesting, right? Because your journey into the IFBB when wellness first came, right? Yeah. Because really before then there wasn't really a place for you in IFBB, right? Because no. you, 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 too, you're like too muscular bikini for bikini, figure. yeah. Right, and you're not muscular enough, enough for, for figure. figure. Yeah. So where do you kind of? There wasn't a space for you. No. My introduction to IFBB was exactly the same. Yeah. Right. I used to compete in other federations, yeah. and then they brought men's, men's physique, physique to Australia, yeah. and I did WBFF as well. I did muscle model, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah. there wasn't anything. I wasn't big enough to be a bodybuilder, no. right? And there wasn't anything else We're on aesthetic. offer. Yeah. And then when the IFBB Pro League brought men's physique to Australia, that mm. was my transition as well. Yeah. So we have a similar. That's how we both ended <laughs> yeah, up yeah. in the same generation. But <laughs> yeah. anyway, I have very fond memories of the 2019 IFBB Pro League Nationals, yeah. right? That was the show because that's where you and I really first met in person yeah, yeah, yeah. was at that show. Yeah. Um, that was the first show that wellness was, was, announced was brought Australia, into Australia, yeah, Australia right? Yeah. So we had wellness come through the state shows and, mm-hmm. then, and then the national shows there as well. Yeah. It was an amazing show. It was at the Plenary in Melbourne, the Melbourne yeah. Convention Exhibition yeah. Centre. Amazing venue. It was an awesome show. Okay. Um, and I remember leading into that show because there was a lot of hype around wellness, right? Because yeah. it was the first time yeah. and there were some amazing physiques come out of the state shows. It was tough. Um, yeah, it was, you know, the standard yeah. was amazing. Like we it had was some really girls good in South first. Australia yeah. come through, mm. Victorian girls, mm. New South Wales girls come through. And it was just like, man, this is like, this is going to be tough. And I remember, I obviously saw photos of you from the Queensland show, but I didn't see you in person. Yeah. And I remember I was sitting in the front row at the show <laughs> and the wellness girls had come out and, you know, the top competitors from the different states and we're like, yeah, this is, you know, this is going to be good. <laughs> and then Jacinda walks out and it's like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. Who's coming it second it? today? Yeah, no, it was, yeah, yeah. It was good. It was, it was a crazy experience. And that was probably like the first time in like competing. I just felt like belonged. Like yeah. it just, it fit, it fits so right. Well, you just, you and know, then, from, from my perspective as a, as a spectator of the sport, as a fan of the sport, and then as a promoter of the IFB Pro League, yeah. you just nailed that. You know, it was literally like this thank is you. the poster girl for wellness. Yeah. And thank this you. is the first show that we're having. Yeah. And you just completely nailed it. Yeah. It was, it, it, it was crazy this up and leading to it and just all the years of competing that it was, it was meant to be. It yeah. was just, it was so special and it was good. And I just finally felt like, okay, like I've got my own little niche now, like mm-hmm. my own, you know, category that I can be myself and train as hard as I want. Yeah. And, you know, not have to pull back on dropping muscle or mm-hmm. getting, you know, too big in my lower half or glutes and things like that. Yeah. And the competition was fierce. Like everyone looked incredible, you know. And when it finally hit me and I turned, um, I did turn pro for the 2019 show. You did. You did. Bit of a story towards it, there but is. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, when I turned pro for that, you know, first in Australia. Yeah. Um, it like I just couldn't I couldn't fathom things. It was just, it was just crazy. It was just it was just like after all these years, like I, I finally did it and I found I found my calling, I found my thing. And, you know, and then from there, like, you know, I even still got my feedback. I was literally at the gym that night, mm. like straight after yeah. comp. And I was like, okay, I'm, I need to work on myself and just make some improvements. And now I yeah. just keep getting better and better, better. Cause yeah. you know, there's always things to improve. Mm. And um, yeah, story was like um, the morning or uh, the day after the morning, mm-hmm. like next morning, you know, I get a phone call from um, Tony. 
And um, bless him. I'm still in really good contact with him, you know, ever since. There's Tony Tony Doherty, of course. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, There was a a big stuff up with the MPC overseas and um, Australia wasn't supposed to announce a pro card winner for wellness. It was Mm. just supposed to be the wellness category, like it's new to come to Australia. If I'm not mistaken, and I I would have to check this with with Tony Doherty, but if I'm not mistaken, you were actually the very first wellness pro card winner yeah. on the planet. Yeah. And, and which this was is not my, this supposed is to be. Under, that's this <laughs> is my understanding. I have to disclaim this because it was a couple of years ago now, but my yeah. understanding was you were awarded the very first wellness pro card on planet earth. Yeah. And the U S was like, no, 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 no. no. Yeah, <laughs> we can't have that. no. <laughs> the first wellness pro card needs yeah. to go to an American athlete yeah. in the U S. Yeah. And so that's why you got that phone call the next day, right? Yeah. Is- so yeah, literally the next day I was like on top of the world. And then we had this, this meeting and this phone call. And I was just like, yeah. it was crazy how I took it. I was just like, at the time I was just emotionless to it. And I was just like, I was just like, that's cool. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Like, mm-hmm. I, I had, I was just like, you know what, like, all right, like I've done it. I've done it now. Um, I mean, I'm still a winner and things like that, mm-hmm. but I was like, okay, when's, when's the, when's the pro card? Like yeah. when's, when can we do it? Or when's when the next show? I, when can I do it again? And, um, you know, I just, I made an admission. It was literally then season A, the year after that for 2020, mm-hmm. that was the pro card, you know, um, winning division. I was on a fucking mission to win that again. Like mm-hmm. I, I literally was in robot mode. Like I did so many extras, so many, you know, different things and like getting cryotherapy and Mm -hmm. um, radio, um, radio frequency therapy. Like I was doing extra cardio, like everything just, I really wanted to win that show again. Like I I had to win that show. So after turning pro and then having that taken off me and then I was just, I need to do this. So yeah, then I came back. I improved myself as well. You mm-hmm. know, they I want bigger glutes and things like that. So I came back a bit more full of glutes, um, full of, you know, lower half and things like that. I do know one mistake that I did do myself was I was just so set on being the most conditioned there, which I was. Mm-hmm. I probably lost my, a little bit of my fullness, mm-hmm. and I know that, um, just because I just depleted myself. Like, I was just so set and, like, robot mode that, like, I wanted to win this. I wanted to be so you know, as far apart, like no girls can beat me in conditioning Yeah, that I probably did come in a little bit flat, but mm-hmm. I know I made massive improvements since the 2019 show. So even it was, it was literally only like, you know, a few months in between, mm-hmm. I came back bigger and better. Well, it was season A. Sorry. And just a couple of things yeah. here, Jacinda, is I need to, you know, you're, you're incredibly humble and I think that uh, that's a great character trait to have yeah but i think that sometimes you kind of skim over details yeah. a little bit so yeah. i just need to flesh them out for the listeners and the viewers <laughs> so firstly the the mindset and the grit yeah. to turn pro and then have the pro card taken away yeah and then to, to stay on track and go, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'll just get the next one. Yeah. Is the mental fortitude to do that is absolute world class. Yeah. I, I honestly don't. I just, I don't know how I just, I honestly just wasn't bothered. Like I was bothered. I know you were Like I was like, I was and annoyed, but I was you, just like, that's okay. And I'm telling you that <laughs> that's having, not normal. No, right? yeah. I had, I had most, friends swearing for me most, and like. Most athletes uh, in that situation, I remember the the whole IFBB Pro League community was just like, oh man, like imagine how Jacinda feels right yeah. now. Like, but most athletes in that situation that that would have broken most people. No, I just you know to no. get to to have that culmination of so many years of effort and dieting and training and yeah. preps and competing yeah. to culminate in that you know when when like I remember when I won my pro card it was like completely yeah. was unbelievable. If you can like remember emotion, the next day, yeah, the emotions like, were amazing. Yeah, so to, to have that that climax and then the next day have that just smacked back on you <laughs> and go, you know what, we made a mistake. Yeah. That is the mental fortitude to take that and use that as fuel. Yeah. That's the, that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Unbelievable. Like, I mean, you could, I could have let, you know, been pissed off and, yeah. and sworn at Tony and yeah. like had a fight with him and stuff. But no, no, like I met up with him and I, I it was literally just like water for dogs back. And I yeah. was just like, you know what, like, I turn it in a positive way and, mm. and, and let it fuel me. And, you mm. know, I really want this. I know how bad I want it. So I was like, you know, I'll, I'll come back bigger and better. It's yeah. fine. 
And like, I think shit happens it, the, for the for the <laughs> listeners and the viewers, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Shit yeah. happens. Yeah. Right? Sometimes you can do everything in your power. Yeah. To achieve a certain something. Yeah. And you can even achieve that certain something, and then for whatever reason, it can be taken doesn't away work from out. You. Yeah. Shit happens. You gotta you gotta adapt. But, you just you, you know, know. Guys, listening and 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 watching this, you know, you mm. have somebody here who is a, a living, breathing example mm. of taking the shit that happens <laughs> and not Stand falling up. into victim mentality, yeah. but using it as fuel mm. to get to the next level and mm -hmm. continue to improve and continue to get better. Yeah. You know, I just think that that part of your story, you know, there's so many elements of your story that are so inspirational, but from my perspective as a competitive athlete, as a pro athlete and knowing what that journey looks like, yeah. you, I just can't emphasize, I can't articulate well enough how impressed it is. Thank you. You know, just <laughs> yeah. absolutely impressive. And then on the flip side, mm -hmm. so you've gone from season B, turning Straight pro, having the pro card taken away. Yeah. I think you're the first ever athlete to turn pro <laughs> twice. Right? History, so history. But then going into season A, 2020. Yeah, straight right? after. Yeah. And so once again, something you skim over here, yeah. right, is this is the start of a pandemic. So yeah. you're prepping for this show. Yeah. January comes, right? So the season A is in March, That's when, right? It's at yeah. the Arnold Australia. It's the amateur show where there's mm. the pro, this is the actual pro card up for grabs now. Yeah. We get into January. There's this talk of this virus. This okay, COVID's cool. Yeah. We get into February. They start shutting they fucking start shopping just, centers yeah. down and it's like stay at home. We get into March. The Arnold Australia gets canceled. Yeah. The pro shows get canceled. Yeah. We had the stage All shows. All of this shit gets cancelled. Yeah, but but you once again you have the mental fortitude to just keep going and say, go. You know what? Let's just keep. Yeah, let's you just know, do it. Let's do it. It's I out think, of my control. Yeah, I was right? just like, I, I, I'd rather like my. I remember at the time my mom was like, "You're not going to Melbourne. Stuff it. Like yeah. you're not competing. Like yeah. we're going with like you know, there's a virus. Mm -hmm. You don't like you're going to come home and make me sick and yeah. <laughs> all this stuff. Well, there was fear. And like it's, it's like, interesting it's, with hindsight. Everyone's freaking out now. We know you know you the know, actual data behind the virus. Yeah, but back yeah. Then, people were like. This is, this is, you know, this is a this killer is, virus. There was a lot of fear associated. Yeah. I remember no one I, was, I was supposed to compete in the pro show. That got cancelled a week before. Yeah. I was still going to go to Melbourne to watch the amateurs. I cancelled my trip because like, I yeah. was like, I don't, you know, I don't know what, what this is. Yeah. Right. And I don't want to catch it. I don't want to get stuck in Melbourne. Nah. What if they shut the borders? There was, there was like legitimate concern yeah. at that point in time. Yeah. Right, but you just went through. You I were just, just like fuck it. I just I have come this far to not come, you know, yeah. like to go all the ways. Yeah. And I would hate to be, you know, if I cancel my trip, yeah, just out of fear, yeah, that you know, to then think like, oh, I could have been on that stage mm. and and the one that category, you know. And Tony, like, he went above and beyond to make that show run. Like he he made sure, and I was just pulled out. All so the thank yeah, yeah, I was so it thankful. It was the show that really shouldn't have happened. Yeah, but yeah. I was so thankful and it was just incredible how he made it happen. Like we just yeah. did it also under wraps in this like freaking industrial shed that mm. was was nothing. Mm. And then he's pulled together this like amazing stage. We had, you know, all the, you know, the girls and other competitors and guys and things like that, you know, to, in a two day event with only so much audience. And then the rest was, um, um you know, online. Mm -hmm. And then it's just from there, I was just, you know, I made it happen. I went there and I, you know, I was just, I'll just give it, just give it a shot. Mm. Let's just do it. Like, fuck this virus. <laughs> yeah, Whatever yeah. happens, happens, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I was just so glad to get on that stage and came, you know, came there for what I wanted mm -hmm. and, you know, made it happen. And then still even after that night or straight after that show, sorry, it was like, Pretty much in the afternoon, I remember then calling my mom and my coach, Emery, because I yeah. stayed at Melbourne all by myself yeah. in the CBD. And this is when things were just starting to get worse and worse by the day. And mm. I just called them and I was just like, I did it. Like, you know, I, fi I finally did it. Like, yeah. I've, I turned pro again. You did it again. <laughs> and at this, this time, it's official, you yeah. know, for Australia. Yeah. And, um, I remember then going to straight to the gym mm. after in my bikini. Mm. I was just like, okay, this is legit. Now I'm on top of the world. Like it was just crazy. Yeah. And then I went to Muscle City and I rocked up in my bikini and robe, got changed. And it was just like unreal from there. And then yeah. I had people coming to me and get wanting to get photos and yeah. just like, it was crazy. I had the most craziest session. And then I remember just going back to my apartment that night and like, I just wanted some alone time. Mm. I wanted to let it just like sink in. Like yeah. I just couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. Like it felt yeah. unreal. 
And I remember everyone going out that night celebrating and stuff like that. And I had people like, you know, like invited me to go out for dinner and party or whatever. Mm. But I was like, no, it's so good. Like, I just want to phone off. Um, I walked like to the best like steakhouse in the CBD and I just ordered up and just got like everything and just was like sex in my mouth. And it was like <laughs> such a long time, yeah. you know, doing so many back-to-back -back shows. Yeah. Hardly having a break between, you know, season A and season B. Mm. And I just, I just let it sink in. And it, it was crazy. And then I remember like doing endless shoots that whole entire weekend. I was being on such a high. And then this virus, it was just, I was just in my own little bubble. I just like just didn't give a shit. I was just, <laughs> just living my life and then like walking around and stuff like that. And then, then it wasn't until like the Monday I was due back home. I was so ready to go back to work and stuff like that. But that's when um, they closed the gyms. Yeah. And that, that alone, I remember sitting back in the, in the, you know, on my flight back home and looking out the window and I was just like, what has just like, that's when reality hit. Mm. And I was just like, what has this, what's happening in this world? Like gyms are shot. This mm. is my therapy. Like mm. this is my therapy being since I was in a tough dark spot since being in school. Mm -hmm. And now that I don't have that, like I started to, like I started to freak out. I think the first two weeks of the pandemic I was doing like crazy shit. Like I was like driving by the gym late night to see if anyone was in there. <laughs> and then I remember so finding, I, I was legit, on the door. legit. Let like I was like, is there people in there? Like, let <laughs> yeah. me train. Like yeah. I was going nuts. Yeah. And the first two, yeah, the first two weeks I was just, I was, you know, contacting all my clients. Okay. What are we going to do? Does anyone have any, you know, like no one had anything. And then at the time people was just, then we're just going crazy buying shit. And then I remember even just finding this little, this little outdoor place of a gym i was like jumping the fence late at night to do their like little outdoor gym outdoor thing yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah just to just get that endorphin release just mm. to do something mm. because that was my therapy for so many years like that's what got me out of a dark spot mm. and then for those first two weeks i started to get depressed and i was just like i've never experienced this like well, would have been in crazy. such a long time it's like the you know competitors know right you you always have the Post comp blues, right? yeah. And if you're not on top of it, it can turn into post comp depression, yeah. And so you've got that happening, and at the same but then time, you not being able to train, not being able to train, yeah. But I did keep, I did, you know, the challenge that I did keep for myself, like I kept really conditioned for the last, you know, um, ten to twelve weeks post show. Mm -hmm. um, but the training aspect, like, it killed me. And then it wasn't until all right, I can sit here and just be a little, you know, sook and shit about it, mm. and you know, whatever, and be depressed, whatever. Or I can actually do something about it. So I pulled um, funds out of my, you know, um, my savings mm -hmm. and I just brought some industrial stuff literally from gyms that were closing down yeah. and I just set my garage up and mm -hmm. I had like proper, you know, set up for like legs, back, chest, everything. Mm -hmm. I contacted all my clients. I was like, all right, well, like we're going to, we can going to continue doing our thing. Yeah. And I just was doing one-on-one -on -one sessions in my garage mm -hmm. and I was doing about 45 sessions in my garage and not paying gym rent, whatever. Like it was, it was weird. It was good. Yeah. But I made the most of the situation. Like Once just again, just do what I could, yeah. It's a common thing, with your <laughs> just story. constantly, just, yeah. Just saying, you know, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. And um, I just, I, I just adapted from that, yeah. And you know, it was I turned a negative out of a positive, and then I was out able to help, you know, other people around me mm. and other people that were in that same rut because I know how it felt and they didn't have anything, so I'd like you know let them come, you know, meet someone and come and train at mine, and it was just a good environment and an endorphin release, you know, mm. yeah. What an incredible ride it's Sorry, been. Sorry, that's, that's, that's far. So, hey? Yeah, it's been insane. Let me ask you one last question. What are your future goals with competing? What are your future mm. goals with business? What does the next, let's say the next five to 10 years for Jacinda Sharkey, what does that look like? Um, at the moment, I'm just like, I've got it in my head, but I'm just taking baby steps at the moment and... Um, the first thing is, is, you know, I recently got myself a new car and I got a Mercedes and that was like, that was my, you know, something, that was yeah. something for myself yeah, that I've worked absolutely. all these years for and just, you know, to have that. Um, so first thing is to, I've got about 30 grand left to pay on that. I want to finish paying that. Then my next goal after that is to buy a house. Mm -hmm. So still that's on the cards. I want to get something big enough that my mom can just live out in the back or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just something that, you know, like I did it for us, yeah. like, you know, and then com um, competition wise, I have been asked from a lot of the IP, you know, promoters to actually go overseas mm. and do a, you know, go in a share house and train there and work there and stuff like that. And to be honest, like that actually scares the shit out of me. Mm. Like, but it's, it's on the cards. So I'm definitely like, 
I'm going to give a little bit more time and just bust out those little goals in between first. And yeah. then when I can, I, I do want to travel. Yeah. And then I do want to obviously do my pro show. Obviously want to make it to Olympia. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's the big goal. That's the goal, you know? right? But I want to, I want to do it when I know I've made massive improvements since my last show. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to represent Australia well. So I don't want my work ethics to be second to none. So I'm just doing what I can at the moment. It's literally just work, train, work, train. Yeah. Um, and it's on a repetitive cycle just so I can, you know, bust out those little things to work towards that bigger goal. Absolutely. Yeah. The future's exciting. So I yeah, it'll take some, it. thank you. It'll, it'll take some it. time and, um, yeah. But you just got to be consistent. Mm. It's just consistency. Mm. Yeah. Well, you've definitely got the life experience. You've got the <laughs> mindset. Yeah. You've got the character traits. You've got the work ethic. You've got the fortitude. You've got the grit. Mm. You've got all of the elements that are required to take it right to the top. You know, I, I am, Thank I'm you. excited to, I've been excited to, uh, I've been completely privileged and extremely grateful to have been a part of your journey thus far yeah. over the last couple of years, yes. um, you know, and everything that you do for us at Massive Joe's and Team J Apparel. And I'm super, super excited to be a part of your journey moving forward. I yeah, think there's, same. there's really, really yeah. good things. Yeah. Absolutely. No, Jacinda, yeah, thank you thank so you. much. It's been, uh, it's been absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank um, you. you know, I, I personally have learned things about you and about your story, just talking off camera before we came on camera and even during yeah. the podcast that I didn't even yeah. know. And I'm sure the listeners and the viewers have taken so much value out of this episode. Yeah. Guys, you know, the one thing that we ask in return, uh, these, these podcasts, we don't run any ads. We don't do any pre-roll, mid-roll, any of that sort of shit. Mm. It's just pure <laughs> content to help you guys yeah. level up in all areas of your life. So the one thing we ask in return is that you share the show. You can share it person to person. Uh, you can tell your friends about it. You can uh, tell your parents about it, whoever. <laughs> um, one of the things that we really do appreciate is if you take a screenshot of whatever podcasting platform you are listening to this on, or if you're watching it on YouTube, take, take a screenshot, post it in your Instagram story, tag mm. Jacinda. Yeah. What's your Instagram handle? Um, Jacinda underscore IFBB Wellness Pro. If you just just go at Jacinda, yeah, IFBB, it'll come. It'll, like, come, it'll be the first one. <laughs> yeah. Tag Jacinda. Tag myself at Joseph Mensel. We love seeing those tags, and we'll reshare as many of them as we mm. possibly can. Jacinda, thank you once again. Thank it's you. been an awesome yeah. episode, guys. You could have been anywhere in the world right now, but you're here with us. We appreciate that. Until next time, we'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs> Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Fitness Times Business Podcast. Be sure to subscribe. And if you enjoyed listening to this episode, make sure you give us a five-star rating. Until next time, we'll catch you on the flip side.